Hi everybody on Facebook and YouTube. This is me, Sluga. I'm going to show you how to um, copy an uncopyrighted DVD to VHS. First, you take your first, you take your movie. We're doing this one, Life After CS SCI. Spinal cord injury. First, you put the disc in. If you get this, then you put the disc in. Uh, you put. Hold on a second. I gotta find the remote. Oh, here. And you, you go to. VHS, rewind, want SLP mode. That's the Fire Stick TV menu. Oh, good. Okay, now we go to DVD. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Opa. Now, to now to um play this video, you hit the dubbing button, which is here, which is my finger. I'll show you guys right here. Right here, the dubbing button. Well, that's power. Dubbing, right here. Dubbing. You click it, and it starts the video. And you guys are gonna watch it. So, enjoy. Hi, I'm Mark Schmidt. I'm a 212 player with 17 years post injury. I'm here today to talk to you about uh, life after spinal cord injury, and that's what this video is all about. We're going to do a number of fun things. We're going to go um, downhill mountain biking. We're actually going to do some two wheel hand cycling in Crested Butte. We're going to do some um, some wheelchair softball, show you what that sport's all about. Uh, we're going to do some interviews with some individuals that have been in the chair for a while, and they're going to talk about life after spinal cord, what it's meant to them, what things have worked, what haven't, what hasn't worked, and then we're going to go to to college and show you uh, that you can go to college after after spinal cord injury, and we have some fun. Uh, you're going to see some neat things. You're going to see some wild things. You're going to see some things that are a little risky, but uh, yeah, that's what life is all about. Also, in this video, we're going to talk about the benefits of standing. Standing is a long-term commitment. You really need to do it uh, consistently all throughout, all throughout your life after a spinal cord. One of the things that I, I really get out of standing is good range of motion. It's the first thing that the therapist taught me when I was when I was in rehab, and, and I really believe in it because um, you really need to keep the hips stretched, you keep, need the knees stretched, and the ankles. So you don't have drop foot. And really, what it does is not, not only affects your overall health it affects your seating because you, if you aren't slouching it allows you to sit up straighter it also allows you to lay down in bed flat um you really keeps you limber um and, and i see that the overall benefits with range of motion is very important it's a long-term commitment um the other things that, that you work with are spasticity range of motion lessens spasticity um respiratory when i stand i breathe a lot different um, I also I have a change of position, so I, I I'm not always um, on the on the back side sitting down. So with standing, there's a lot of benefits. Overall health is uh, is affected. So what we're going to talk about is also you know just basic standing. Why you should do it, how often you should do it. You should really look at it as a, as a, as a long term commitment. And now life after spinal cord injury. Enjoy the show. Check in, it's fairly routine. Uh, they're going to ask you a bunch of questions about how much assistance you need, what you need. Do you need an aisle chair? Do you need help down the aisle? Uh, do you want an aisle seat? Do you want a window seat? My suggestion is um, take a few trips and you'll learn what, what works best for you.
I find it easiest to go to the curbside, uh, check in luggage almost right away, and then go directly to the gate. That's where you seem to get uh, the best seats. Uh, make sure you go there early enough, at least an hour, hour and 50 minutes before the flight. Another thing um, you want to do is make sure that you get a gate tag on your chair. And what that will do is get your chair to the next destination. Um, it's, it, you cannot be paranoid enough to make sure that happens. Uh, you, you really need to get the gate tag and mention it to the flight attendant that uh, the gate tag, that chair gets on the, on the plane. One of the great experiences you get to do also with air travel is go through the security station. And you don't do it like everybody else does. You go around, you don't go through metal detectors because you will sure will set it off. You'll put your bag onto the conveyor belt, but, however, but what you do is go around and they won't risk you. Um, it's not a big deal. It, it's a, a light pat down just to make sure you aren't carrying anything. They'll check if you have keys. They'll, they'll have you take those out. Uh, but, but it's fairly normal and it's easy to do. One thing that um, a lot of airports have are disability uh, services. And, you know, it depends upon where you're at. Like in, like in uh, Chicago, uh, you, they have actually a lounge for the disabled where you can actually hang out. And, uh, kind of get away from the crowds, but um, here they have special parking, they show where it is and you know what kind of rates you can get. Um, I think you can actually get uh, regular parking in, in the short term, uh, you, you go in the short term and pay regular, regular price, so just keep in mind that almost every airport has something, you know, for the travelers with disabilities. Make sure that you add the pre board The last thing you want to do is get out after everybody else because it's really a, a hassle and also all the uh, luggage room is taken up and you have to deal with bumping into a lot of other people.
and then on Route 1, we'll switch it up, and whoever went downhill mountain biking, we'll go hand cycling and vice versa. So, some of the people to introduce, Christy Grouning, she came out here from Northern California with some of those downhill mountain bikes. Um, she came out here with Bob Vogel, who was outside. He's Bob will help out with the hand cycling portion. We have Sherry Ramsey over here. Experience, she's like top hand cyclist in the country. One of the top. Second. Second. <laughs> I train harder though. <laughs> we just did uh, ride across the Rockies with Bob Vogel, so she's pretty fit. A wealth of knowledge, I think, to give us. Um, everybody's important here, but we're trying to get through the crew. Steve is going to be the main man for um, downhill mountain biking as far as um, trail selection and all that. So um, Steve's going to work with Christy and Matt, who is one of the main men as far as downhill mountain biking. Second. Only to John Davis. <laughs> I'm sorry. And um, so the lift opened at nine. So sorry we got started a little late, but I just want to introduce a few people. One of the most exciting things about joining in on different sports programs is you get to meet people from all over the United States. The camaraderie, the food, the, the, the stories. So you get to meet a lot of different people and have a lot of fun. One of the things about these sports is you have to you use a lot of different equipment and it gets a little bit tricky getting into them. However, there's a lot of volunteers who are there to help you and, and you can watch what the other people are doing, the veterans that have, that have gone through the program, and it becomes second nature within the day. Yeah. Using the ski lift is a little bit odd in the summer, however, it's the only way up to, to the top of the mountain. Going up the lift, first time. It'd be awesome. Can you dive? What? 60 degrees, 65? There it is. One of the things about these sports is that they all carry an element of risk. And you need to listen to the people who have gone through it before and listen to what they have to say about safety. Uh, get to know, get to be a little bit more familiar with it. As you progress, you know, the next run, you can pick it up a little bit more. You guys let me know. If you want to go a little faster, I mean, we can do that within reason. But I, I don't know the terrain very well. Steve's going to be the, the trail guy, so um, I think there's going to be a little single track. Yeah. Little but single you got track. Mark and uh, yeah. Topher, you, Topher, you've done that little single track. We're going to dive off into there. They might have even improved it a little bit, I don't know. Downhill mountain biking was a blast. Now we're going to try hand cycling. You see all the different hand cycles in the magazine, but I would suggest trying out all of them, and this is the perfect venue for that. This program lets you try out three or four different brands. I'm Carrie Ramsey, and I live in Littleton, Colorado, and uh, I've been hand cycling for about uh, three or four years now. Uh, two years competitively in racing, and it's fun, and it's a great exercise, and you get out there with all of your friends with regular bikes and go for it, have a good time. I did the ride to Rocky Mountain about a month ago and spent seven days climbing the hills and going down hills and it was a blast. Yeah, I was trying. These three wheelers are amazing. You get to go so close to the ground and you're moving at a nice speed. You get to hear the gravel underneath the tires and you're really rolling along with nature. 
that's what we want to do is whoever's going to leave when you see a bump or something or cross and you see a car or you don't see a car you know point it out chuck hole here bump there whatever um you know it's clear or stop wait for the car to come and also when you're in the lead wait let everybody know that you're going to do something hey, i'm going to stop uh, whatever so so they don't run into you um, and you can get as close behind some of these as you want, but it's good to give them a couple of feet so they feel comfortable with ride. And um, let's go ride. Sometimes you run into things that are just utterly ridiculous. Here we go. <laughs> You've been waiting for tables to be fun. Sitting around outside your restaurant, just hanging out, talking about the adventures going down the mountains, along the trails with the three wheel bike. What a great day. Sometimes you just have to go around the obstacles in life. Well, there's Man, after a long day of mountain biking, this food is going to be great. After dinner, we decided to hang out with some locals and play some shuffleboard. Second day of uh, downhill mountain biking. Great, great day yesterday, and the sun is unbelievable. It's like 70 degrees here. Just great. Uh, had a great time last night. Hung out, went out with Mexican food, and went to a local bar and got the flavor there. But we're going to try and do about three to four runs this morning and head back to Minnesota. This is our friend Christy showing that she has no fear going down the stairs. Yeah, baby! So far! One of the more exciting aspects of downhill mountain biking is going on single track trails, which are basically trails dug in by able bodied bikers. What it is, is basically going down a mountain really fast and trying to straddle the sides with a four-wheeler. It's a rush that you will never experience with anywhere else. This next trail is a little bit tougher and we're going to need some help from our volunteers to get there. Thanks, guys. This ended up being our fastest ride. What a rush. Down the hill, 25 miles an hour. Adaptive Sports Center is located in Crested View, Colorado, and our program pretty much does uh, skiing, snowboarding, downhill mountain biking, all sorts of cycling, hand cycling, whitewater rafting, you name it. And we're located out in Crested View, Colorado, but there's a lot of programs throughout the country for people to get involved in. I felt bad. I had to stop on the Hi, I'm Chris Paul. I'm a post-AD, four years. I'm a 271 quadriplegic. And we're about to show you a product that's just unbelievable. You stand, and you don't only stand, you exercise your arms. And while you do that, you get a good stretch in your legs. This easy stand glider helps keep me in shape. Because you never know what kind of medical breakthroughs are right around the corner. Join me later at the end of this video to learn more about the EV Sand Glider. We're at the, at the 23rd Annual the National Lobster Softball Tournament. You can look at the scoreboard. We've got teams from Nebraska, from St. Louis, from Toledo, 
So three or four teams from Minnesota, a couple teams from Colorado, we've got uh, uh, Chicago, a couple teams from Wisconsin, Chicago, Wisconsin. So it's a pretty big lineup and uh, it's going to be a fun time. Uh, so expect a long weekend of good softball and good, good competition. Here we go. I'm Ollie Kissmeyer. I'm the uh, umpire in chief for this wheelchair. It's the 23rd annual wheelchair tournament, and it's a lot of fun. If you haven't seen it, come on out and take a look. It's been growing every year since I've been connected with it. It's about I've been to the national seven years in a row, and that's about ten years that I've been uh, working with this program. If you think you know how to play ball, sit in a chair sometime and try it. See if you really know. Fun parts of this game is ball is hit out to left field, and the batter is thrown out at first base. Uh, where do you see that in, in normal play? Uh, it's the same game as what they play on the outside. Uh, the only difference, or three balls, uh, the only difference that we have is that we play in the wheelchair. And uh, there are certain uh, situations that it makes it more fun, more interesting. The double play ball at second base is fantastic to watch. You hear the noise going on in the background? Somebody just got a good hit, they made a good run, and now they're ready to go on with the game. Let's hear from some of the players. How they got here, what they're up to, what their life is all about. My name is Tom Wheaton. I'm originally from Minnesota here, but I lived, uh, I, the last three years lived in Colorado. Been hurt almost uh, almost 11 years. Actually, uh, today, actually today was exactly 11 years ago that I got hurt down in Australia. And uh, I got to tell you, I was paralyzed from the neck down for the first uh, few months. And after trying to figure out how I could get on with my life and learning re physical rehabilitation, learning that I would be in a wheelchair, I started getting involved with some wheelchair sports and an organization called the Paralyzed Veterans of America. One of the sports that I started up about a year after recuperating was a sport called sled hockey. And then right after that I also played uh, wheelchair softball. And uh, I gotta tell you, I've had a lot of fun there because I got a chance to meet people who are having fun with life and learning more about how to live life than really how to swing a bat or to play hockey. And I learn about uh, different ways you have to go to the bathroom, or about how you transfer into cars or beds, or different ways to set up your wheelchair so it's easier to push. Uh, you know, the sexuality issues, just a number of things that have really helped me out. So that's why I really cherish playing the wheelchair sports because I get a chance to rap with all the guys and gals and learn about, uh, you know, well, what it takes to, 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 to continually adjust uh, being a disabled like I am. But I got to tell you, it's been a fun ride, and now I'm one of the coordinators. So now I'm kind of one of the people that are kind of letting, letting people know after 11 years of experience about some of the things that are happening that work, some that don't, and it's just been a real good thrill. So, uh, butcher softball and sled hockey and a uh, number of other activities, that's, that's what I've done and it's worked well up for me. So, I hope you guys will get encouraged to try butcher uh, sports because the first year or two of being disabled, I really had a tough time being with others in chairs. I kind of had the feeling that everybody maybe had pity on themselves or whatever. And I certainly uh, kind of came around and decided to play with these guys. And uh, I couldn't have been further from the truth because I'm having so much fun. Just uh, continuing learning and, and uh, the camaraderie and getting to realize that people alongside my, myself are uh, really living life to the, to the fullest potential. My name is uh, Dan Heike. I was injured in 1989 in an automobile accident. So I'm, I'm a T9, uh, complete paraplegic. Um, went to the uh, National Memorial Medical Center for my uh, initial surgeries and rehabilitation. Uh, from there, the fall of 90, I started school at the University of Minnesota. Uh, spent uh, five or six years there, uh, studying a math degree and working part-time as a tutor. And uh, during that time, I uh, had met some people and started uh, getting involved in wheelchair sports. Uh, first sport I got involved with was softball, which we're playing on here today. And, uh, from that, uh, the ball came and basketball season came around and uh, I've played that now for seven or eight years. I'll be 10 years uh, post-injury this September night. Um, also shoot trap, uh, do a lot of hunting and fishing, and I use a, a flare, a four-wheeler to get out in the woods and I've adapted it with the back and stuff for um, uh, getting, getting 
just about any place that we can. Um, I don't know if we'll do any place. And, um, and you can do anything that you want, basically, after your injury. I, I do everything that I did before, only in a, in a different way. And uh, you know, just, just got to uh, keep your head up. Uh, you can't change what's happened in the past. And, and go forward. Hi, hi, I'm Keith Hanner and uh, Alias Seven Number Hammer to call me, but I'm uh, about an 18 year veteran in the wheelchair since 1981 in a diving accident, and I went over to Sister Kenny Sports Program and had the opportunity to go to Hawaii for the 20th National Wheelchair Games. Um, sports has been quite a rehabilitation for us. Uh, I would highly recommend anybody with new spinal cord injuries being a six, seven quadriplegic. Uh, got involved with quite a few of archery and table tennis and swimming, and it led more down the road to quad rugby, wheelchair softball, and all and on. Sports has been great. Uh, you get to meet a lot of people, travel, uh, keeps the mind and body active, less depression than that for spinal cord injuries and paraplegics. Um, along with the accommodations that organizations put up for you and it's been wonderful to be involved with Curry Center Sports and Sister Kenny and travel the world and see and meet a lot of other people. But again, I highly recommend anybody with new spinal cord injuries to get involved with uh, local, local chapters, DFWs, and see what you can do. Uh, my name is Todd Kimmery. Uh, I'm a C5, C6 level plug I was injured back in uh, 1982 in California in a water accident. It wasn't until I got to Minnesota that uh, I got to uh, the, the privilege to be invited to start softball. And uh, with, with the wheelchair softball, they need quad plastic. So, uh, and I had enough uh, function to go ahead and uh, be part of the program. And, and so that's what got me started. And then from there, I met other plugs that. Uh, played uh, quad rugby, and uh, that's the main sport that I'm involved with right now. In summertime, I do softball. In the uh, fall and winter months, I do quad rugby, and that's just for quad plegics, and uh, everybody gets to play on that, and that's a lot of fun. So for the past five years, I've been involved with uh, playing sports uh, with the quad rugby and then this uh, softball. I'd really like to encourage people that uh, uh, are recently injured, uh, spinal cord injuries, uh, entities that are uh, recently injured, to get out and participate in disabled sports. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, the uh, player's uh, ability will increase, how their chair movement will, will, will get better, how uh, uh, hanging around with other disabled people, how much uh, what a good effect that has on you on them in their life because they're, they're with people that they have the same problems they do and face the same challenges in life. And with success uh, uh, comes uh, higher esteem and that's what we see. Those, those are some of the benefits of getting out and playing with this uh, We have a website up. It's uh, www.wheelchairsoftball, one word, dot com. www.wheelchairsoftball.com. Visit the website. Uh, on that website is a list of the team reps of the teams around the country that are, uh, are presently uh, organized. And uh, we shortly we'll be having instruction on how you start your own team. And uh, there will be phone numbers, etc. cetera, on there how to get a hold of us. Who are we? Healthcare professionals have been prescribing and using the easy stand for several reasons. Standing aids in preventing atrophy of the leg muscles, as well as improving your range of motion. Standing helps lessen spasms and contractions. Standing is also vital in maintaining bone integrity and helps reduce swelling of the lower extremities. Standing assists in helping kidney and bladder function, which can reduce infection, as well as improving bowel function and regularity. Standing strengthens the cardiovascular system and builds endurance. It also improves circulation and helps to prevent the cubit eye by changing positions. In the patients that I've seen, uh, we uh, have not been on a standing program. They are high risk of developing fractures from uh, very simple uh, falls uh, from their wheelchair. We can develop further kidney problems, including uh, renal stones, uh, which can uh, lead to kidney failure. 
the patients here, we get them standing as soon as possible, and they continue to stand throughout their rehab program. And then when we do send them home, we recommend that they stand at least every day, and it helps to maintain the bone density and prevent osteoporosis in the future. When you're confined, you know, to a lift chair, or a wheelchair, or whatever, you have to, you're, you're not independent. But the minute I got in my, uh, my easy chair, I felt very independent. Standing has made me feel more confident about myself. Not that I just have to be in my chair, but that I can do other things. Stand up right along with everyone else. No matter what type of standing frame you use, the evidence all points to one fact. Standing is critical to your health. Before beginning any standing program, you need to consult a qualified physician or therapist. <laughs> We're here at Southwest State University in Marshall, Minnesota. This is my old alma mater. I went to school here from 84 to 88, got a degree in marketing. And we're going to visit with our basketball coach, um, Dale Erickson. He's the wheelchair basketball coach. He's a C6-7 quadriplegic. And uh, actually, him and I played on the team back in 1988, 87-88. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about going to school after spinal cord. And, Practice some quadriplegics, maybe a couple of pairs, and let's um, let's see what school's all about. Hey Dale, thanks uh, to have you come back here and check out the college. Thank you. Are you gonna show us around? I'd love to. Great. All right, let's go. Everything here at Southwest State University is wheelchair accessible. Every room. The weight room here is set up for wheelchair users gives them helpers down here if you need anybody to help you do any of your lifting here. We're heading down to the gym area now, and down in the gym area you'll find a trophy case that's set up for the Roland Mustang, and it has more of our hardware in it that we've garnered over the course of 30 years of competitive sports here at Southwest State. Visiting Southwest State here, we're going to the student center. And once again, accessibility is no problem because you're going to find ramps all over. Now let me take you over to financial aid, which is where every college student should know where the building is. Minnesota is very fortunate to have Southwest State, such an accessible school that really thinks about the disabled and, and really gets it integrated into the programs. But I would suggest looking around in your area, there's a number of different schools around the country that are very much like Southwest State. Hi, I'm Nancy Kerlick. I'm with Ultimate Medical. My background is in occupational therapy as well as assistive technology supply. Just wanted to let you know that there's some very important issues when you're applying for your standing funding. If at all possible, please consider applying for the funding at the same time you're applying for your wheelchair funding. It will help you probably get the process through in a quick, timely fashion. If you have already applied for your wheelchair funding and you'd like to go ahead now and apply for a stand or also, that still is a possibility and your therapist should be able to help you work out the documentation. But if you have any questions, you can always call us at Ultimate Medical. We'll be happy to provide you with this funding guide and it walks you through the process of assistive technology funding.
Now you guys are gonna watch the second part. Mark Schmidt, marketing director here at Ultimate Medical. Um, I just want to talk to you today about Life After Spinal Cord Injury Volume 2. We started out with Volume 1 and it really did well. We sent out thousands and thousands of these to newly injured spinal cords and we covered a lot of subjects in this one. And, and we also had a lot of people ask for other subjects to be covered and one of them in particular was transferring. It's one of the most difficult things we go through and we're going to start off with Alan Focus in the video. Um, he goes in, he, he's a C67 quad, he's also the president of Ultimate Medical, and he gets into a lot of different um, transferring situations from weight machines on up to, you have to see him. Uh, we're gonna, then we're going to go to a Minnesota cabin and see how Ron Hagen outfitted his cabin and his, and his uh, pontoon and really see how you, know, you can make things work in life. He also was very, he has some very good opinions on what you should do after you have a spinal cord injury. Um, he uses a power chair and he's got some unique things that he talks about there. Um, then we go to Rod Cahoot. One of the things about Rod that I found that was very, very interesting and very fun is that he really doesn't see the chair as a hindrance to getting around. Um, he does the same things he did before he was injured. He does also some things that we don't recommend you do at home, but you have to wait and see that and watch the tape. We're also going to go and talk to Renee Summers, and the one thing about Renee that, that we, we really picked up on was that she's newly injured. She's about six months post, and she talks a lot about um, what it was like the first six months. Probably the same predicament that a lot a lot of us were in, and getting getting situated and figuring out where you want to live and, and all, you know, friends and family, what, what their role is in your life. And now we're going to start out with Alan Tokus uh, and Life After Spinal Cord Injury 2. Uh, today I'll show you some of the transfers because that's very important. You need to realize that you do have the ability to get in, in and out of vehicles, and, it's, and you can get in and out of situations, in and out of bathtubs, in and out of things. Uh, and there are some technique, techniques. There are some techniques that you really, uh, once you're aware of them, I think that might. Uh, might help you out. And I think what really helps me out a lot is just being able to see somebody else in my situation uh, do something and, and, and just to visually see it uh, it gave me encouragement and kind of an understanding of the techniques involved in doing that. So we'll go through some of the physical uh, things involved in transferring something which is really important uh, in society, a very mobile society, you want to be able to get around and move around and I think if it, especially if you want to be able to get to work and do work uh, create your opportunities, mobility is very important. Okay, uh, right now we're kind of in the back room in, in uh, my place of business, and in back here I have a weight machine. And I'd just like to just give you a little demonstration on how I hop in it and use it. Um, I try to get on it uh, a couple times a uh, a couple times a week uh, and, and kind of work out again as I mentioned earlier I think it's important to keep the muscles you do have keep them in good shape uh, I've been in a wheelchair over 25 years and I try to just use what I have and keep it uh, in, in good shape and, and really you know you want to stay as healthy as you can and this always helps in transferring if you can keep what muscles you have in good shape uh, keep your strength up the transfers of course are going to be easier for you so I'll just uh, I'll hop into the weight machine and just do a couple things that I would normally do to kind of keep the muscles toned up. I'm going to go through a series of different uh, transfers today in different situations. And I'm just going to describe uh, 
kind of the procedures I go through and some of the different things I try to consider and think about as I'm making the transfer. Um, one of the key things and most important things, and I'll probably say this throughout the video, is, is really in leg placement and where you put your legs. I think that, that you really think of it as kind of a leverage point and a balancing point. And they play a very important role, at least for me, in, in the transferring process. And also I look at, you know, where do you put your arms and, and grab stability that way. Uh, with the C67, I, I don't really have any trunk muscles from here on down, so I do all my balancing with my head and my arms. So there's a lot of, you know, you, you kind of use your arms a lot to keep yourself stable, and also you use your legs also. They play a very important role. So in this situation, I, I kind of pull up to it, and sometimes closer is not always better. There's a, during the process, there's that, at one point, it's kind of almost like when the shuttle is returning, there's a point to no return. Uh, when you're coming in for a landing, you, you really need to make it, you just kind of hit it. I will position my hands, and I make sure I usually get one put in. In this situation, every situation is sort of different, so you kind of size it up. And I'd like to add that in the transferring process, while you're transferring, uh, the first time is always a little difficult, and you always kind of uh, develop the skill or the technique. And by, by the third, fourth, or fifth time, it gets a lot easier. So don't get discouraged if it feels awkward. Just try it a little different, try different things. So in this situation, I'd probably go like this, and I want to edge myself to the end of the seat, and then I'll uh, kind of, it's all in position. My leg's kind of resting against here. I got one leg here, and it's kind of sitting, it's kind of budging here and then I kind of make the jump onto the chair. So I position myself here, here, I kind of grabbing different things, I make a move, and you can, once you get it down pat, you can usually go pretty quick. So if you look at the situation, I'm in, I'm in a really tight quarters here, so I don't have a lot of space around me. So you have to, you have to sort of work with that. Again, I get my feet in position, I'm hanging on to something for stability. My feet are actually giving me stability. I get where I want to go, I'm going to lift this up and move this leg over. And uh, position my feet. And I'm on the exercise machine. And we'll do uh, a number of exercises. And again, this is building and keeping the muscles toned up, which really aids in transferring. So you try to do a number of different exercises, pull downs and uh, variety of things, and just try to work with whatever muscles you have. Again, I've got uh, good biceps and good triceps. I've got good biceps on this arm. My triceps are, are pretty weak on this arm. Uh, and generally, you'll find that you transfer one way a little better than another, so you, and that all has to do with positioning your chair when you make the transfer. It becomes like a second nature. Uh, and what I think about is, I used to think that the transferring process was a real, was a real hassle. And it, I mean, it is a, sometimes a real challenge. But I think of it like um, individuals have to get up out of a chair um, and stand up and walk. And what we do is we do the transfer. Okay, and I'm going to transfer back into the chair. I bring the chair, I kind of position it. Well, I think I'm going to make the transfer into the chair. I lock the chair wheel. I uh, get ready for my position. I got a place to sort of pull my head if I need to. I got my shoulders going to hit on that a little bit as I transfer to sort of stabilize me. And I transfer into the chair. So you, you kind of use the parts of your body. You lean it on different things. And... Uh, and that that comes with the with after doing it a few times. You really need to do do it a couple times, and you kind of learn how to make that transfer. If it's a common transfer that you do on a regular basis, again, small area into kind of a complicated looking device here, but you know, hopping in and out of it goes pretty quick. makes a difference, doesn't Two it? inches, uh, to some people, it's like a, a whole foot to me. Yep. Just for the simple reason, you can see out the windows, your head down here. 
I used to go six foot, six foot when I was standing, so that's, that's, that's the idea behind it. So you, you drive in, and you actually you actually uh, have a seat taken out of there. Yep, you have to seat out. The other front seat is, uh, you can unhook it and match it, put it over underneath the driver's seat if a person wants to either ride or drive it universal. Great, and the seat belt is right in there, so you don't have to, you don't have to strap that in. I got the seat belt. And then you have a lockdown right down there? Yeah, I got the seat belt so I don't have to go on the ground to get it. I kind of got it hanging there. Gotcha. And uh, on the bottom is the lockout. It's basically just like it sounds the lock. I go in and it locks into the wheelchair so the wheelchair can't move. Okay. And when I want to back up, I just push a button and it locks it. And I uh, hit another button and the uh, ramp and door open up for me. And away I go. Sweet. Pretty self-sufficient. I tried one of them big vans, the big Ford vans that time. And the uh, night nice main difference would be easier driving, easier everything. parking, and everything. It's down lower, you got more uh, window view, 100 times easier to handle. And like I said, I can do it all myself without help from nobody. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. Hold your brakes, huh? got there is pretty much what it looks like. It's just a ramp uh, built in with the side of the pontoon, little latches on top, and down you go. It's pretty simple. Got to kind of drop my head a little more than average because we just dropped the lift down because the water was getting so low. What I do is I just go in one. Back there, right around the helm here. The helm's been altered a little bit. Basically, what they did is they moved it to the location where there's as much accessibility as possible. Where's all that accessory? A little bit. So the wheelchair doesn't win here. I go up as far as I can. Of course, my wheelchair locks by itself. Press the button, Mom! And away we go. Why are these here now? What? He's older. I'm still using them. I don't want this. It's up in front one of them white seats. And Lots, okay? Yeah, no. It's pretty universal. Oh, you forgot to have one of these. Anybody can drive it. So I'd be you know. It's a handicap. I'm going to go to the other one. Oh, yeah. Are you yeah. Hey, Jokey? Yeah. Why? Here, take that corner. Can you see that corner there? Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, that's about take the it to the other side of you. Make it accessible. Now pull it off. Look up one of my videos. Let me know. I've been here since 1989. I was married here. Here's a month to be exact. Had a truck accident, the uh, front tire of the sweet corn truck of my own I was driving. Had blown out one Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. And the rest is history. The truck, truck flew and flipped and rolled and broke my neck. T5-6. Could be a lot worse, I guess. And uh, I was a farmer at the time. 1,500 acres, 800 hogs. 500 cattle. Kept me busy, let's say. Yeah. It was, it was, you probably wonder, was it hard to leave? Yeah. Hardest thing I ever tried to do. But you, you, you finally get over it after a while. Leaving a farm in life. The rest of it all comes with, with time, but it's leaving a farm in life and having to have to rely on so many other people all the time. That's, that's one of the main reasons why I got this pontoon, so I wouldn't have to the help carried in or whatever, and I like the water to begin with. Other than that, that's about it. How about you, Phil? Um, probably, uh, probably inaccessible areas. Oh, yeah. I always people want to go to places that aren't accessible. I usually, I usually adapt. Oh, yeah, you're a parent, so that, that helps you out quite a bit. Versus me being a quad. 
Most of it's common sense. Yeah. You know, small things you can do just instead of thinking about it, just do it. It's absolutely right. Like for example this. Then all of this is two uh hose plants. It's the uh end of a of a garden weasel. Yeah, that's what it says right on there. Okay, that's all it is. When you when you buy a, one of these garden weasels, they give you a handheld one. I started thinking one day, I said, you know, that just might might do the trick. So I put a couple of hose clamps on it and put some duct tape around it. And here we are, just make this 100% easier to do. Yeah, that's what Okay, now you've, you've seen everything go good. I'm going to tell you when things don't go good. For instance, I had some buddies up this last past uh, 4th of July holiday. They had a dog. I'm watching my kids swim. The dog's on a leash. Now, if you can visualize this. I moved ahead where I thought the dog was at the end of its leash. It was like a 30-foot long leash. Well, the dog did hit the end of the leash. But as it was doing it, it swung in front of me, made a U-turn, wrapped right around me. Its leash bounced up my knee, up my chest, caught me just like this, and he kept right on going. I'm doing everything I got to keep that dog from going any farther. Luckily, the dog finally stopped. But as you can probably see on my neck, what happened? I got a vicious rope burn out of the deal. So that's just, you know, everything looks good, but that's just one of the things that it's not such a freak of nature. Number one, you could I could have fell out of the chair and been sitting there. Number two, it could have been worse yet. That dog would have kept on going, who knows what could happen, but that's just one of the freak things you got to just, it's called life in the wheelchair. Put a cigarette lighter in my wheelchair, now I never have to worry about the cell phone going bad. I got it with me all the time. It's right underneath there. Yeah, it's right underneath there, and it works slicker than you know what. Just something simple. It's just something simple you can do, but a lot of people just don't think of it. It just happened to come to me one day. Uh, but it is, I mean, it's something so so simple that, and I don't know. With, with the cell phones out there nowadays, I would suggest anybody in a wheelchair to have a cell phone. Um, I mean, it, it's just because you will get stranded someplace where you can't get out of. And that's that one time will pay for it the rest of your life. They are easy to get hurt in. Until you get the hang of it, which is basically just the joystick, you know, more work back. Until you get the hang of them, it, it could break your leg. Uh, it could throw you out. Especially your feet. You've got to watch your feet. It's not the thing I ever had to do. Yeah. I was in a small farmhouse in Bird Island where I used to live. We lived there for three years, and I found out, well, there's got to be more than Bird Island, and sold the house in Bird Island. That's why I moved to Bloomington. It's a bigger, bigger city just for accessibility, because if you were down in Bird Island, you couldn't get into a drugstore. You couldn't get into a, a grocery store, I guess you could, but restaurants, everything. All of that's kind of the main reason I moved to a, to a bigger city. Watch yourself. Well, it just in the beginning, um, the one thing I did, I learned a lot was uh, I got involved in sports. I learned a lot of the tricks of just the everyday living from, you know, um, you know, urinary care and ball care and all that. And, uh, clothes you can wear, clothes you can't. Uh, you know, when I when I first, uh, in back, it's actually not that far away from when you were injured. Uh, um, most of us were driving, at least the ones with the manuals, were driving, uh, manual wheelchairs were driving two-door cars to put a chair in. Yeah. And um, started buying trucks with club cabs and minivans and adapting. And things have changed quite a bit, but... Uh, Why, that'd be easier? That'd be a lot easier. Yeah, you got to want a Blazer. i got a Blazer, Chevy Blazer. That works a lot easier than a, a two-door or four. Well, it, I don't know if it necessarily works easier, but... Um, you know, we have to deal with snow. Yeah. Last thing you want to do is get stuck in Minnesota in the yeah. foot of snow. Yeah. But um, anything else, uh, you know, when you were first injured that, um, you know, 
uh, adaptation is the main thing. You just got to get used to the people stare. I mean, I don't know how many times I can tell you, you know, they'll sit and stare at you. So finally, I just got bold and said, what are you staring at? <laughs> huh? Yeah. I just, that's, they continuously want to stare at you. And they not just for a little bit. They'll stare at you from one end of the mall or wherever you're going to the other. You just want to, you know. Probably the, the, the one thing that I uh, ran across a lot is, um, I, 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 I don't mind people ask me what happened, but to tell me that they they know how I feel or they've been in a chair for two weeks and they know what it's like to be in a wheelchair. One thing I found out, your true friends will, will stay with you. I bet you I've heard 200, if, or if not more times, mm-hmm. oh, I've been meaning to come and see you, but whack, 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 I've been this, I've been that. That's a bunch of BS. I mean, if you wanted to come and see me, you could have made time. It ain't, and, and, but, you know, it's also vice versa with me. It'd be a little easier for people to see me versus me going to see them. But still, your true friends, I found out, stick by you. They'll come see you for no reason. Mm-hmm. And they'll keep on seeing where or the ones that weren't your true friends you find out at the end. They pretty much, uh, after the first year, the sympathy party's over and they, they go their own way. And that's pretty much it. I, I found that, that, that out to be a big thing. Or perhaps they don't have to deal with the disability then, right? problem live with it. Yeah. It's sad to say, but it's true. Yeah. That's exactly what they think. One thing I don't mind doing, though, is talking to kids. <laughs> They're curious. Kids, that's kids, actually kids. been rather easy. Yeah. Kids, um, kids, they don't bother me. Yeah. They're always curious. Yeah. Uh. Where the grown-ups, you know, they, in my opinion, should know better. I mean, it's, but the kids, of, of course, are curious. Yeah. For, for some reason, I don't know why it is. But kids seem to uh, be glued to this wheelchair. Yeah. They'll come and talk to me out of the blue. And, and they, have, they have no problem with it. Okay. Well, Ron, thanks for the ride. No Appreciate it. Thank you. Good. And uh, being well, your neighbor over here, I'll be, I'll be seeing you again. Exactly. Let's take a look at how easy it is to stand. Um, just take a look at your watch or, or count your head 1 1000 to 1000 and see how long it takes me to go from sitting to standing. Now, I am a paraplegic and I, and I have been post injury for no, a number of years, but the transfer is something that you can learn um, at all levels of disability. And I'm going to jump into the easy stand uh, glider and I'm going to show you how easy it is. Um, a little bit about transferring. Um, I do it one way, um, which is I put my leg across so that when I transfer over, my weight is going to go, it's going to follow along into the, to the other side of the stander. I use the pad as a third arm, I rest my head on that. Put the safety straps in to keep my legs stable. And then I pump myself up. Very simple, very easy. Obviously, I set this uh, easy stand up for myself. It's at all the heights I want. And you're going to have one at home that you can do that also. I put the side supports down, keep me in place, and I'm standing. So now if you look at your watch, how much time was that? About 20 seconds. Not a lot of time to go from sitting to standing and be ready to stand. Now I look at, if you notice I'm talking a little bit differently, my breathing's a little, little more labored. It's because I haven't stood today, and the first um, five minutes, it usually takes me a little bit to get used to the standing position but I am ready to, ready to exercise. Very easy, very simple. I, uh, I, I stand on the average about four times a week, about a half hour at a time. I try to do it at the same time all the time, um, just to get a, a habit down. Um, I tend to watch Fraser at 10 o'clock. 
This makes it easy. Getting out is as easy as getting in. Mark, um, continuing on with Life After Spinal Cord Volume Two, and we're gonna we're gonna meet with a, a person that I found that I find very unique. Um, he hasn't gone to the desk job that a lot of spinal cord injured people do. He's stuck with what he loves, and we're going to really go over the different things that he's not given up um, since be becoming a spinal cord injured person. Um, his name is Rod Cahoot. And we're in a in the top the hometown or uh, this where he lives and it's the grass, Minnesota. Population one thirty three, small town guy, big time heart. Hey Rod. Hey. Thanks for having us here. Oh pleasure. Appreciate pleasure. it. I heard a lot about you and I heard that uh you get you um, haven't given up on a lot of the things that you like. No, no, a lot of a lot of the stuff that I used to do. Yeah. It's a little bit different doing it. So, so give us a little brief background of you know how you ended up in a chair and maybe uh, what you've done afterwards. Well, I at the '96 I got in a or '95 February '95 I got the snowball accident. I went down a drain ditch and broke my back and I just went through the rehab and all that and. And since then, I got a job as a diesel mechanic. I'm not working on the engine part itself. I'm doing more of the truck service, oil changes on them, the, like the brake service with all the air systems on the truck and stuff like that. I do pretty much that kind of work. I understand that uh, between the time of your accident now, you've, you've gotten married and... Yep, yep, yeah. I've uh, got a wife and got a daughter that's seven months old now. Seven months old? old. Yep. Yeah. So we're going to meet those in a little bit, too? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Meet them in a little bit? Okay. Well, let's head over to your house and take a look at what you've done. All righty. Well, this is the kitchen. But I guess we haven't done with it yet, but we're working on it. It's in, in progress or whatever. I guess the trim left to put up. And Looks like new cabinets. Yeah, we took down all the walls and put in all new insulation, it's all new wiring and new ceiling and new cabinets and got some trim yeah. work. Yeah, trim work left to go. Yeah, we got all the trim to do yet on the So you, you mentioned that you, you did mo most of the drywall on this. Yep, yeah, it was me and my wife. It was I did I needed some help with the ceiling, but other than the ceiling yeah. it was my wife and I pretty much did everything in here, so I did a lot of Hop up on the cupboards and sit on a five gallon pail to reach the top of the cupboards and stuff like that. But that's so yeah, what, what makes work, you know. So it takes good balance to do stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that comes in time. Another thing that I didn't give up is my. I had a van when I first got in my accident and I didn't really like that. It was another thing recommended by the rehab. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You should have a van, you know, make it yeah. accessible and. I mean, I don't know, I guess it was just like, it was too big and too wind caught you all over, push you all over the road and too much gas and I just, it wasn't for me, I'm more of a pickup kind of guy. So you came up with something that, yeah, yeah, I got a lift that lifts up, I designed it and built it, it took me like two years to build it, but I uh, put together a lift that picks the chair up and okay. puts it in the back end of the truck and away I go. So if you want to take a look at it, that'd be great, let's take a look at it. This here is what the chair actually sits on or whatever to pick it up. So just go in and hop in my truck. Pull 
Field Paint Town. And I got the switches here on the door that I put in. And so we'll go fix up the chair. And away you go. All right. So that's a little different, I guess. I have never seen anything like that or whatever. So yeah. What? Does, does a good job. Gives you a little bit more independence and yep. they don't have to give up the truck. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Dad. 
Bruno. side supports and I modified the brake uh, but it's an automatic and I just need to put it in uh, drive and go and it has forward and reverse so uh, if it allows me to go to places I would never get to in my wheelchair um, so I'll demonstrate how I uh, transfer to this and uh, use the ATV generally when I use the ATV I'm usually with a buddy or something because I'd hate to get stranded out Nowhere. So basically, uh, again, it's kind of a unique transfer, and as I mentioned earlier, it takes technique and a little bit of practice, and it uh, gets easier and easier the more you do it. Well, for this transfer, I, I, I generally will start off by, again, leg positioning is key, and I might add, the more you transfer and, and get into different situations, it really keeps the joint slimber, so range of motion is important. And transferring uh, really helps during the motion. So, um, again, a lot of positioning. Then we uh, put that leg up, and then uh, position this leg right here on the uh, running guard. And I position myself, and I, and I kind of. I position myself just right before the transfer and get my leg over the hump when I transfer it'll slide over and this kind of gives me support there. I'm holding on here and here and I'll lift off with my right arm. So then position, position and transfer. And uh, simply I'm going to adjust my speed. And there. Ready to do some ATV four wheel. <laughs> Hi, I'm back here again with um, Life After Spinal Cord uh, Volume 2, and I'm with Renee Summer, and she is a P66, and she's been injured for a little over nine months, and we're, we're going to kind of run through a little bit about what it's been like uh, from her date of injury to now, and, and she's, uh, she's was the unfortunate um, person to have, it done, have an accident on New Year's Eve, I believe? Yes, tell me things first. Can you tell me what happened? Um, my boyfriend and I were in Bemidji, Minnesota, and I was downhill skiing, and we were skiing all day, and at the end of the day, 
Um, we're gonna do a couple runs and then go show or go back to the hotel, whatever, and go out. Yeah. And, and on the last, obviously the last time down the hill, um, mm -hmm. went over a jump mm -hmm. and um, hooked up in the air, and landed on my back and broke it. He's sick. He's sick. Uh, and I knew right away. As soon as I, as soon as I landed, I, I couldn't feel my leg. I was like, you know, people were, you know, it was laying there, and Don was right there, and they're like the five fell and I, I'm like I cannot feel my legs I need help I knew right away so they got you off the hill and yes and that into the into the hospital yes. did you go to a, uh, a a local hospital yes at first and for how long were you there um two hours until a helicopter could come and take me to Fargo okay. and then I had to wait for an airplane from the cargo to take me to Rochester. Uh, and long couple days. Yeah, yeah, long day, yeah. long day, long day, night. I was long day, easy. <laughs> not quite the way you had uh, intended. No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. So you started off the year in a little different situation you thought you would be in. But uh, what, what was rehab like? What was the first couple of, couple of weeks? Oh, overwhelming, overwhelming. I remember the first day, the first Monday that I had a um, first day with um, occupational therapy and physical therapy. I'm just like, take me back to my room and put me to bed. <laughs> you don't want to do anything. Oh, it was, it was exhausting. It was um, just everything you take for granted. I couldn't. Um, they had done surgery on the Wednesday before and then Monday is when they uh, threw they threw it into my head right away. Oh wow. And did you have a brace on? No, I didn't. No, no you I didn't. didn't. Wow, that's, they, that's great. I know, I nice know. From a guy that had one, yeah. And they said that was standard, E C standard. Yeah, yeah. I asked my surgeon, I said I really don't want one. I it slows your therapy down. Yeah. And he said, I can't promise you anything, you'll know when you come out of recovery. Yeah. So when I came out of recovery I'm like feeling I'm like oh, no cat. I was yeah, I was happy with that. So, so this is um, my new Sylvania SRC D two one two pants, putting on your socks, putting on a shirt, and this is what I'm from surgery. Listen to they went three levels up and three levels down, so it's oh, a really? pretty big incision wow. and two rods and twelve screws. Right so it's a pretty big incision, so it took a while for that to heal. So you're going through rehab while that's still healing. So two painkillers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and watch my thing. Part, especially you probably use the bed to balance yourself and, and yes. they the hospital beds have handrails and they yeah. they kept threatening me. I could I got to use them at first, they were really nice about it, yeah. but when it was getting time that I was gonna have to leave the hospital, um they kept putting them down like every this morning so they were down so that I could get up on my oh, own. I went. This is my just, just recently books. going back to our test with the therapy, um one of that was one of the big things laying on my back and trying to get up on my back. Yeah, I think it but sounds so interesting, but it was it was quite difficult. Jeez. And um, my therapist had a gentleman that had the same injuries I did, he fell off a roof, and he was at that same point that I had been at months ago trying to get up on his elbows. And it's just, it's did fine. You yes, I did. I'm like, you, you won't be able to do it. I oh. had raw elbows and oh, so it. sore, but eventually. I now I do it, you know, every day, and I don't think anything of it. So yeah, but back then it at, was a big step. Yes, at that point, the day I could get up on my elbow, I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else in rehab did you, did you uh, experience? Did you uh, just all uh, transferring? Probably I mean, the big one, no? Yes, yes. Um, just being able to lift your we your own legs and put them up onto the bed and put them down. I mean, now I don't think anything of either, but. I'm like, I am never going to be able to lift my legs and slide my legs. You didn't know they weighed that much. Yes, yes. It's like, gosh. Like, and then, yes. And then, it, it, for me, it seemed as though I was, you know, very, I was very active, walking, jogging, outdoor activities. So my legs were really plastic mm -hmm. after a while I was in rehab. So just when you think you're going to move one way, your legs want to do something else. So overcoming that now you know that your your muscles atrophy but yeah. that was that he, was, also, he also gained strength yes surprising yes. how 
know, but did you feel really like you had no strength or? Oh, none at all, none at all. And with, you know, if they, they told me in the hospital, I think this was for encouragement, they said 85% of the injuries with the spinal cord are male injuries. Yeah. So I was in a rare population anyway, and oh my gosh, yeah. And I, I never had lifted weights, and they have you uh, lifting weights and doing things to build the upper body strength, but holy cow, you just <laughs> can't imagine, you know, how that, that was a real wake-up call after my accident, how... You know, you don't realize what your lower body, what you all need it to do, just daily things. So how, how long were you in actual rehab? How, how many weeks or months? Um, six weeks. Six weeks. Yes. At that wow. point when you left rehab, where were you at? Just put it you transferred yeah. and doing your own thing? Uh, I could get myself water. dressed. Everything, okay, you get yourself dressed. everything took a long time. I could get myself dressed. I could do my own um, bathroom care. Um, 23 times. I had come home two weekends okay. before that. So so had, yeah, had Recorded a, Books presents an unabridged recording of In very an very Instant, a family. It's very exciting because love. you're in the hospital for so long yeah. and you're excited to get home, but it's, it's scary because you just don't know what it's going to be like in the hospital. You can call a nurse or, yeah. you know, yeah, well, or or yes, yeah. yes, uh, your doctor. And when you go home, it's like your family, they, they haven't dealt with it. And we, we had an experience, you know, not anyone in the immediate family that had an injury like this, so it was new to all of us. Yeah. So, thankfully, I have my brother, yeah. which I always thought was like a curse, yes. but I'm finding out that it's great. They're very awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And my mom and dad, gosh, right. I think that my life. But it was, it was scary coming home for all of us. Yeah. And we so it's it's learned a lot in the process. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So when you first came it. home, was the house accessible? Or what did you have to do? Um, we, I could not get into the house, so we put our temporary ramp in the garage. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite steep, but I could at least, um, they could help me get in. And I could go down it nice and fast. Exactly. At least it was a uh, means to get in the house. Yeah. And it's a uh, rambler style, so we we're very fortunate that way. And my um, dad's office was converted into my bedroom. Oh, so you lost his office? Yeah, so I was moved downstairs. Okay. But, um, so that worked out quite well. I was very lucky that way. The bathroom needed some hand bars and um, my bath bench that I purchased while I was in um, Rochester okay. in rehabilitation. So I noticed you, you put up a ramp? Yes, one foot snow, um, one way, and as soon as we could, um, someone came and put a ramp on. So nice, so nice, and it's great. A lot of, a lot of good, it makes the independence a lot easier. Yes. Getting uh, adapted. Absolutely. I was so, the day that it was finished and I could get in and out of the house on my own, I was like, Dad, thank you, I love you. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it seemed quite like a small thing, but it was, it was great to, to give me independence. And so once you're home, in a couple months, what, what, are, what were some of the tougher things to get used to? So for this short you know, video, realizing, even even now, I should have to wake up and think, how is this just a nightmare? And, you know, mm -hmm. Am I going to wake up and I think like, shut up. my old, oh, you know, being able to walk, but, yeah. and other days, I, other days I wake up and I'm like, this isn't so bad, I can do this, yeah. but it's kind of a roller, roller coaster, the first few months, yeah. it's just, one day you're fine, the next day you're crying, you think, oh, nothing, and, yeah. And, uh, okay. Is there, I like to give a shout out to my YouTube subscribers. Of time where you finally felt that you were finally accepting it more. Subscriptions? Yeah. Yeah. Is there like a home? Please subscribe to over? Mm -hmm. audio. Sometimes, um, gradually, like some days, like some weeks, I feel like I take a you know giant leap forward and get the ramp. Are you something, do something like that, and then other weeks you just feel like you know everything is just going backwards, but um. See you later. I guess it was just gradually that I find SML. Getting the, you know, Super Mario Logan. And everything and Lance 3. And just realize, okay, this is how it's going to be. Let's make SML it SML Flush. Like, Adam B. It's very, very, it's very hard to see her go through it because I can just, just see it. You can just see it in her face and how, in her reactions to certain but things. Anyways. And, um, so it's just, the address is 111 Metropolis, 
I don't know what I was doing or what she was doing. She talked to my dad, and I just heard her just like gut laugh, just laughing, laughing, laughing. I'm like, that is the greatest. It was my day. It was the greatest. It was just the greatest to just hear her outright laugh because it didn't. The first months were really hard, really hard for me. Cruise. And I, oh, you know, that made me feel a little bit stronger because we I didn't want to you know, bring everyone else down and sit around B. and cry. And I'm not the type of person to put it on and so forth. Adam B. Live, he does have his hip be up. I just feel like George is like, okay, I'm going to be able to get in my car and be able to drive and um, you know, get up and down this ramp and be able to take care of myself, dress myself, take care of, you know, daily things like that, which. When I was in the hot, some days I have to think back to that when yeah, I could yeah. do that. When I think Eating I didn't go there, I have to think back, okay, you have to remember when you could not even get your own pants on, and yeah. then that uh, encouraged me. Alex, how do you enjoy? Amazon Alexa. Yeah, yeah. Amazon Prime Video. Um, um, I'm Amy Carlo, TV. Okay. Because I had a French seat. It was a two-door car, okay. which they recommended Amy while I was in the station. Um, so that I could um, transfer into my car and um, pull the wheelchair and in the back seat. Oh, Andy Cassidy, Andy Grandma. How many months before you got your car and how many weeks or so after? Well, I was very fortunate. I'll, I was driving I'll right do away. some more later. Yeah, yeah, right. I got my no, car right away. My youngest right. brother, he was my guinea pig. Uh -huh. um, but I was very lucky having hand controls. Actually, they did it in Rochester while I was at it. Okay. Every, every one of my therapy appointments, um, a couple hours they put the controls on the car right away after we bought it. And um, so I was driving right away, but the chair part, oh. Tough. But yeah, they, when you're, well, you like have a sport chair, but mine's more of a yeah. rigid, so they you need more support because your, your balance is off, everything is off. Yeah. So, um, I, it's, it has, it's like 45 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Getting it, I don't know how to do it, but the, we tried it, um, in my company, they have this, they actually have a car in the building. Mm -hmm. And it's a orange Mustang. All right. And um, it was the 1970s. Yeah. <laughs> and my therapist and another therapist um, were there, and they were showing me the steps of how to do it. So I knew the steps how to do it, but to actually be able to do it on my own, I guess that was probably a big milestone too. Okay. It was like I would I'd practice in the garage when it was snowing and rainy. Um, I would go up there with my little, in my wheelchair and just practice getting, getting into the car and getting back to my chair and then getting in the car and then getting the chair in. And that took a long time. <laughs> Pretty much a day. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I haven't been back to work yet. Um, when I was in rehabilitation, I was every day, you know, one time to go back to work, one day I'll go back to work, and that was always on my mind. And then once I realized the challenge of everything that I had to do, I kind of took a step back and people, few people, <laughs> they recommended take some time off and just get used to the situation and I'm very, very glad that I did. Okay. The time that the summer was spending it with my nieces and my nephews mm -hmm. was priceless. Was priceless. And, and, and staying with the cabin quite a bit. And yes, yes, which gave me mixed emotions also because last year, I was water skiing with my family there, and this summer it wasn't like that. But so I always wanted to be there, but when I got there, it was kind of I love it there, but yet it was bittersweet. Yeah, yeah. So then I go home, and I was sad, and I wanted to be back there. So that was that was an adjustment also. Okay. Yeah, I, I believe that. But you know you can water ski. Yes. Yeah. It's a matter. Yes. And I'm getting better with those. So I went through. I did go through a stage where. I was like, I can't do this and I can't do that. And everyone would say, well, there's so many things you can do. You can mm -hmm. ski again. You can water ski. You can downhill ski. And I'm like, but I know, but it's not the same. It's not like, you know, you have to learn it all over. You have to, you know, purchase the equipment, mm -hmm. and, which is very expensive. Yeah. So it's, and now I'm to the point where, yes, you know, I can, I learned how to roll the blade. I would, you know, it's yeah. like you just have to purchase the equipment and you have to learn how to do it. But for a while, I was, very frustrated with the fact that I was doing, you know, as of last year, I was doing all this and had the equipment and could just didn't have to think, you know, how am I going to get there? Is this place going to be accessible? Mm -hmm. You have to just, there's so much more that you need to think about. Yeah, questions that 
that are just, uh, and they come up every day, I suspect. Yeah. 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 Um, like, you're a pro, and you travel all over, but just in the beginning, just little things like going to church, can I get into church? Oh, yeah. Going to the grocery store, can I get the door open, or is it an automatic opening door? Yeah. Um, are there steps if you want to go to a restaurant? Are there steps? Is someone going to be with me to help me? Restrooms. Um, yes, restrooms. Are they big enough to get into? Is there a handicap accessible one? But they did tell me in rehabilitation that um, Minnesota is one of the it is. one of the most advanced states, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, let's take it out to about six months, about three months ago, and then compare it to now. Because you, you mentioned that you were all the big advances and they probably come towards the a little bit further down the line mm -hmm. learning and anything that you said has happened the last three months um, just that it's everything it's you fall into more of a routine i'm getting it's when i first came home it seemed like just getting getting up getting dressed showering that, that was the whole day oh, yeah. <laughs> and, oh it seemed like it you seemed know, like it. And, you know every, old time when you, yeah, when you yeah when you you know you're up dressed and whatever yeah. off the door and now it, it, i can you know i mean it changed all the time and it doesn't take very long and go to the bathroom and get in the car it's just everything so i have more of the day for other things but when i first came home being only in um rehab for six weeks you, you're still a lot of things you don't know and you're uncertain about and you have questions about and you're not very good at doing those things still like getting dressed and lifting your legs you're still weak from surgery so i would say that that's been a big a big plus is that all that stuff takes a lot less time yeah <laughs> because in the beginning i was like oh my gosh i'm never going to get anything done in a day because this, this takes all day uh, when they came out with the sliding door on the driver's side, it allowed me to transfer in and then pull my wheelchair in uh, behind me. Uh, prior to this, I've had a van with a lift in it, uh, more of a full-size van, and I had a little platform lift that I'd wheel on to and bring me into the van, and then I would transfer into the seat and then drive from the driver's seat. Um, Again, uh, what I'll do is demonstrate how I get into the uh, minivan and pull the chair in. So let's give it a shot. This particular minivan has an uh, electric sliding door. So sometimes I'll get in and just push the button and the door open. But, uh, so first I approach the van and open up the door. And of course, right now, obviously there's no car here, and you always want to watch out for that when you're parking the vehicle, so you have enough room to uh, get into the vehicle. One of the nice things about developing the ability, if you have the uh, strength to pull yourself into the van, is that you don't have to have as much room between yourself and another vehicle. Uh, sometimes when those lifts come out, they take up a little bit of room. Um, so basically, I uh, approach the van. And when I first got the van, it was really awkward uh, trying to get into it. So like all transfers, uh, the first few times, it takes a few times to, uh, to really develop the skill and uh, the technique, as we call it, for transferring. Um, basically, come up and uh, put my brakes on. I'm a C6, C7 quadriplegic. I've got pretty good biceps and biceps, pretty good uh, biceps and kind of limited triceps here. So this is a good approach for me. Um, Anyway, again, like I mentioned earlier, um, leg placement and foot placement is real critical in, in the transferring process. Um, you notice this is quite a height difference from, from here to here, so I usually want to make sure the seat is as low as it will possibly go. Uh, the van is not modified in any way. It's a standard vehicle uh, right off the uh, showroom floor. Um, basically, I kind of get positioned. I kind of do a little pre-positioning. Uh, my knees, I need this leg on the footrest is kind of wedging against there. Again, once you do it a few times, you really don't even think about it. So, so I edge myself out to the edge of the seat and I don't even move my arm rest. So now when I make the transfer, I generally sometimes I'll use my head as a, as a support. Uh, but otherwise I'll, I'll get up and uh, transfer into the seat. So here I go. There. And then I put my arm up here for stability. And I just kind of get uh, my butt up onto the seat. And then I'm sort of halfway in now. That first transfer is pretty critical. You just want to kind of get up on the edge so I'm into the seat. Right up there. 
right over here, pull myself back, and kind of make a motion to pull my leg right in like so. Again, my other leg in for stability. Push myself onto the seat. And once I'm in the seat, I kind of get myself stationary. Always keeping uh, my stability with at least one arm or one hand. And I, I kind of wedge in here pretty good. Now I'm going to roll on. Get the brakes off. And you want to sort of be careful while you're parking, say not by a hill, and I'll just sort of be careful about that. Uh, try to look at flat surfaces. And I'm just going to get the ways of kind of maneuvering that chair. Yeah, yeah. This chair, I just reach around like so. Grab right here. And it's a very light chair, so it makes it a lot easier. And I'll pull the chair up. And I'll hook my hand behind it. I'll slide the chair in. Position it. Put the brakes on so it doesn't roll around while I'm driving. Now, the band before this one did not have an electric door, so what I did is I hooked a little cord onto this uh, mechanism that uh, closes the door, and I had a little cord here that I would pull. Okay, now I'll demonstrate exiting the vehicle. Um, basically, uh, my first step is I, I usually open the door, get it open, position my leg out a little bit, so. And I'll open up the door. Brakes off. Position the chair. I just got to tip it back. Kind of holding that part of the chair here. Hold it onto the arm. Let it go. Kind of give it a little turn. If there's an angle on the ground, sometimes like a position, the chair will have it roll into the band. In position, and bring it around. Put the brakes on. Now, going down, I find it's always a lot easier than going up. So, it's a matter of kind of position. Again, kind of getting myself positioned. As you can see, I got this one leg down, bracing myself with my arm, my foot is on the ground. This one's kind of dangling, but I know from experience as I transfer, it'll just kind of follow me where I need to. The leg, again, an important pivoting uh, point on your body. So you kind of work yourself to the edge, and then you make the transfer. And you just kind of drop yourself in. You try to control the drop, so you don't put a lot of pressure on your body to transfer in. Again, position the feet. So, walk the vehicle. Or your hot banana, good man. Grab on and go. Hey, you're so polite. Yeah, come on, Paul. Oh, yes. Yeah. What all the way around this thing? For around, yes, I got uh, these sticks here. They're like a portable hand control. And this is just something that I found on the internet or whatever. And I use that for running the clutches and stuff. I just throw it on there and away you go. So, uh, these controls over here. Just you put the implements up and down and different adjustments on it. And these are the shifters here. Newer tractors, they got like power shifts and stuff like that. So you don't have to use the clutch. But this is this one here doesn't, so I do use the clutch. So I guess that's that and I gotta go to work. <laughs> Hi, this is Alan again. I'm going to uh, demonstrate one more transfer, uh, and that is getting into my three-wheeled uh, motorcycle. Uh, we call it the three-wheeled trike, I guess. Um, and this uh, 
vehicle here, I guess this track here, I designed and developed. Uh, I was injured in 1976 and uh, started building this in 1980. So I've had it over uh, 20 years now. And it's an ongoing project of mine. So I'm always continually sort of working with it here. Uh, I got a kit that it's uh, really a, uh, a Volkswagen uh, engine and drivetrain with a Springer front end. And uh, did a few modifications uh, that allowed me to use the bike. So, like I said, I've been using this uh, track for about 20 years, and really is a, a, a fun vehicle to drive in the summertime. So, anyway, some of the things I've done is I modified the seats on the bike. I put in a, there's actually a jet cushion in here that uh, allows me to sit for long periods of time without worrying about a pressure sore. I put some uh, side supports on. Uh, it gives me more stability, a little more secure in here. I have some, uh, added some uh, leg support that holds my legs in. And uh, really, that's about it. It has an automatic transmission, so I just simply put it in drive and go. So what I'll do now is just uh, show you how I transfer in and uh, use my uh, bike. Well, this is one of my easier uh, vehicles to transfer into. I simply pull up to the unit. Uh, again, positioning the legs is always important. Uh, pull my leg out. Throw my leg over the seat. Like so, just kind of position it so that when I transfer, it just kind of falls right over. Again, get positioned, get ready for the transfer. Find places to hold on to and make the transfer. Just like so. And I'm now in the bike. So once in the bike, I get my left leg position, put my side supports down, and then I will uh, go ahead and put my uh, cushion away. I store my cushion right up front. And I pulled the wheelchair up. And I put my leg in Down here. As I rounded the edge of the lake, my cell phone lit up. It was many days. The one person I knew in the world who would understand what I was going to say. Here, position a couple of bungee cords. And Another modification I did to the bike is I put a hand brake over here on the left side, so I brake and dance. sitting to standing up right on your wheelchair. Um, but one of the things that's unique about our model, which is the ovation, is our lifting mechanism. And what it does uh, with these specially made arms is rather than pushing you into the knee pad and lifting you up, it actually kind of raises you and then pulls you into the standing position. It's very easy. Gets into standing. Get your hips over center, and you're ready to go. 
to be real excited about the simple uh, successes that you'll have and that you'll experience and uh, pat yourself on the back because it's, it's, it's some real challenges, uh, but there's also some real joys that you'll experience in your life. <laughs> No matter what you might have read, no matter what your mama said, don't go away and have to grab that She outlined strategies for dealing with my two different age squares of kids. <laughs> 